Hi, I'm Stephen and welcome to Watch Out. The pressure's really on because I want to rebuild this movement habit working properly again. I got this movement on eBay for about $35. I have not yet successfully rebuilt a movement. I want this one to be the first one because the plan is this is going to be a gift for my dad who recently celebrated a significant anniversary. Um, when I got this on eBay, it was not running. The seller was very honest, showed internal pictures. The balance was absolutely had it. So this has been to my watchmaker. Thank you so much, Brian. Brian rebuilt the balance or whatever he needed to do to get the balance working. So the movement is now running. I just knew that getting the balance rebuilt was beyond me. But that's all he's done. Uh, and it did get the movement running, so that's really good. Um, I really like the look of this watch, even though it's, it's pretty cheap. Nothing especially special about it, but I like the face. The, the dial is kind of unusual. And, you know, my dad would not appreciate it if I went out and bought him, you know, a used Amiga for, you know, a thousand bucks or something. He just would not appreciate that at all. So he'll appreciate this, even though it's not worth that much, um, if I can get it torn down and rebuilt and hopefully give many years of good service. So I'll need to loosen the setting lever screw to get this out of the case, which should be this one. There we go. One case screw. Two case screws. I wonder how many there are. There we are. Well, the first thing that I can see, having a look at the dial side, this movement is absolutely drenched in oil. And I mean drenched, it is just unbelievable. I mean, look at that, there's a pool of oil right there. All around here, this is all oil. Just unbelievable. You know, where does this stuff come from? You know, it doesn't just get absorbed out of the air. Someone has put this in here. So it's really just quite unbelievable. Anyway, I'm going to start tearing this movement down. And so the first thing I'm just going to do, you notice there's this little uh, spring brass washer that goes between the dial and the dial side. So we're just going to take that out because it will almost certainly fall off when I turn the movement over, as will the hour wheel. Yeah, look at that oil, that's just incredible. So we'll take that out. Yeah, <laughs> it won't let go of the tweezers. It's stuck to the tweezers with the oil. That's just unbelievable. So what we need to do now is to remove the balance is the next step. And this is the most fragile part in the entire movement. So I've got the screw out that secures it, just one screw holding it in place. And there should be just like a little, it's a little notch just here. So I can carefully just 
prise it out of its locating position so that it's loose. There we are. And now I need to even more carefully remove it. There we go. Right, so with the balance out, I now need to let the power out of the mainspring because all the power is still in the movement. It's not running anymore because it doesn't have the balance. That's what allows the power to be released down the powertrain. But there's still all the power in the spring, so we don't want that because otherwise it'll just go everywhere as I start to disassemble the watch. So what I need to do is let that out. And I think I'm gonna be better off without these cots on. So if I just grab that little ratchet with the tweezers, I can now release the power just by, the only thing stopping it from unwinding all in one go is my fingers on the crown. So I'm just sort of controlling that as it unwinds. There we go, look at that, no power. Okay, so coming over to the motion work side now. So we've got this massive pool of oil that was sitting just underneath the dial. So I'm just gonna try to basically get rid of as much of that as I can. And didn't really achieve very much. Let's see what a cotton bud will do. Okay, that seemed to get rid of the worst of it. And then I'll just use some old Rodico just to kind of get rid of the rest of it. Now you can probably see the amount of fibers that were hanging off that Q-tip. We don't really want to be getting fibers wrapped around the watch. Obviously, you'd never do that after it had been cleaned. This hasn't got to be cleaned yet, but um, yeah, that's doing a good job of soaking that up. Way too much oil. Right, so we now start taking the motion work apart. Here we have the minute wheel. Gosh, that's got really low. Oh, there we go. Oh my goodness. That's terrible. Look at this. It's absolutely drenched in oil underneath. Oh, look at that. Goodness gracious me. You know, I, I almost wonder if someone has tried to do to this movement 
what I'm doing now. As in, you know, an amateur who thought they'd have a go at um, tearing it down and putting it back together. Because I can't believe that anyone who had any idea what they were doing would put that much oil. Okay, so we've got our intermediate wheel here. Yeah, look at all this oil. That's just incredible. Hopefully you can see all the oil on the Rodico. Wow. Okay, so now I'm going to take the Canon pinion on, which is kind of the interface between the center wheel. So that's the, the watch part, if you like, that moves, rotates at a set rate. And the motion works, which is where our hands connect to. So I've got this special tool which is called a Canon Pinion Remover Tool. And let's see how we go with this. There we go. All these parts are so drenched in oil that they're just sticking to the tweezers. One thing to note, this thing's got a center seconds hand, so we can see the um, additional pivot coming out for the seconds hand, so I need to work out just how that's driven when I get to the other side. But anyway, for now we'll just continue on with this side of the movement. Right, so I'm going to take this really strange looking part, actually just before I take it out, I'll show you how it works. This is the, this is the setting lever spring. And you can see the way it works is this kind of little, this is the actual spring here. This is all kind of like plate that secures it and holds other things down. But this is the actual springy part. You can see it engages with this lug here. So this is actually the setting lever. And you can see that hopefully there's a little groove just here uh, in the winding stem. And this pointy bit is sitting in that groove. So when I pull on the crown, this gets pulled this way. And the whole thing, because of this round spot where this lug goes and the springiness of this you get a really positive feedback when you pull this so that's how you know when you're in the hand setting position which is now and back here that's the winding position and most movements they kind of work on a variation of this theme interestingly the the movement that I did my my noob tear down on. The principle was the same, but the actual mechanism was somewhat different in the way that it um, gave you the feedback. It didn't actually have like a spring arrangement like this one does. So this is kind of the point where we want to be fairly careful because there's another spring underneath there. And the last thing we want is for that spring to disappear. So I can actually... Just take away... Setting lever spring. Get that out of the way. Okay, so this is the spring here. And what it's actually doing is 
this part here is called the yoke and that moves it back and forth it's it's kind of like what pushes the uh, winding stem into its normal position if that makes any sense at all it probably didn't but anyway There we go. So I just eased one side of it out above the lip. So that took the spring tension out of it. And that means it isn't going to fly away. There we go. Look at that. Again, that is completely drenched in oil. That is just shocking. Look at that. The underneath of it's drenched in oil as well. Terrible. Whoever did this must have run out of oil, I think. They used so much of it. Alrighty. So that's um, this side of the movement completed for now. So we'll turn it back over and um, start on the trainer wheels. Right, so the click spring actually goes underneath the ratchet wheel. Soaked in oil underneath the screw is a pool of oil. Kind of really surprised that this watch ran at all. Unbelievable. Okay, that's pretty neat. Okay, so now the crown wheel. This one is usually reverse thread. And it is reverse thread. Okay, so we've got two parts here. There's this part here, which is the wheel itself. And then there's this little sleeve. Right, so now the barrel bridge needs to come off. There we go, just a little slot there to prise it up. Just 
So now at the train wheel bridge, we've got three screws for this as well. See these holes are full of oil. <laughs> yeah, again, they won't let go of the tweezers because of the amount of oil on them. So this is an arrangement that's a little bit different to what I'm used to. Now admittedly this is only the second watch I've ever worked on. But yeah, the wheel arrangement is different. And that will be no doubt because of the way that the... Because it has a centre sweep. So if you saw the, um, the last movement that I tore down, the fourth wheel was driving the seconds hand. So the fourth wheel rotates once a minute. And so what you'd have is the barrel is the first wheel, then the center wheel is the second wheel. Then you can see this is the third wheel here. So again, it's kind of a bit tricky the drive is it's been driven from underneath somewhere that I can't see okay I see it must have a massive hole it does have a look at that it has a massive hole it just sits in there and then there's a jewel underneath that it's sitting in So first, second, this is the third wheel. And the wheel that I took out, it goes through the center wheel as the fourth wheel. And that makes sense because the fourth wheel drives the second hand. And this watch has center sweep. And then we have the escape wheel going to the pallet fork. Okay, neat. This is the escape wheel. These holes are all full of oil. So I'd say this thing's going to need a few goes in the um, cleaning machine. Just for the sake of getting rid of all this oil. the underside of that look at that just soaked in oil 
So there's the barrel. Let's pick it up that way. A hunk of rodico is probably the easiest way. So the barrel goes with the, it's got this square shaft that engages with the ratchet, so it goes up. And this is the center wheel. So all that's left now is the keyless works, and we can just see, um, just get a good idea just under the microscope as to how these engage with one another and the way that they go around. Obviously they have to go back the same way. So basically, if I just take out the um, setting lever screw, Let's see if I got that. Yep. Setting lever screw, it's just again stuck to the tweezers and then it's stuck to the side of the box. There's so much oil on it, unbelievable. So now the winding stem should come out, the other bits just fall out, and just the setting lever itself I think is stuck underneath the movement, behind the movement holder. So we just need to find that. There it is on the table. And there we are, there's our main plate. That's all that's left of our movement now. So we just need to disassemble the mainspring barrel now. I guess that's what you'd call off. That's the second watch I've done that on. Right, so I need to get all of these parts cleaned now, uh, especially given that most of them are absolutely drenched in oil. So I've got these little uh, brass baskets that I put all the parts in. And because I'm still, for crying out loud, Absolutely stuck. Yeah, because I'm sort of still learning, um, I like to keep the parts kind of grouped together. Oh, this is ridiculous. don't think it's magnetism, I'm pretty sure it's the oil. These are anti-magnetic tweezers. I've not had any problems with magnetism on them before, so it might be something that I'll just check, but I think it's the oil. So yeah, because of the amount of oil, these are probably going to want more cleaning I think than usual. So anyway this is the general plan. Get all the parts into the boxes and I'll come back to you when we're cleaning. Okay so I've got my little brass baskets are inside these little jars 
and the jars have got isopropanol in them, IPA. And so that's what I'm using as my cleaning solvent. And so then I'll just put this in the ultrasonic cleaner and then use water just as a medium to transmit the ultrasonics into the jars. So this works pretty well. I've used this a few times. Uh, so this will be, I think because of the amount of oil, this will be a multi-stage cleaning process. We don't clean the pallet fork in here because the jewels are kind of, uh, they're glued onto the actual pallet fork as well and we don't want to dissolve that glue with the IPA. So I'll use um, some one dip to clean that, which is a specialized servant, uh, solvent made by Bergen. Um, it's actually a, um, a mainspring cleaning solution, not a mainspring cleaning solution, a balanced spring cleaning solution. So I'll also clean the balance with that, although this balance is brand new because my watchmaker rebuilt it for me, so it should be pretty good. So yeah, so let's get the ultrasonic cleaner started. There we go. It'll run for 30 minutes. It's going to need a couple of goes. I haven't got all the parts in there either, so I'll need to uh, do the other ones. So I'll come back to you when all the parts are cleaned and ready to be reassembled. But just while this is cleaning, thank you so much for coming along on this with me. Please do subscribe to my channel. I can't tell you how much it means to someone just starting out a new channel for you to sub subscribe to my channel and say how much you appreciate my work. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do subscribe, give a like and share. You might also like to check out my other channel, Audio Nautica, which is mostly about hi-fi gear and a little bit of maritime nautical things as well. And I'll come back to you when these parts are cleaned. Right, so after many hours, I've got this thing cleaned. It took a lot longer than I was expecting because you saw all that oil that was on it. Um, I think I made a bit of a blunder. I should have basically tried to hose as much of that oil off as I could with cleaner. I put it in the ultrasonic and basically what happened is it kind of, it kind of hardened in the ultrasonic cleaner. I'm not really quite sure why. I'm using isopropyl alcohol as my solvent, which is usually pretty effective. I'm um, not sure whether heat might have had something to do with it. I'm not using the heater. don't want to use the heater. Um, but the ultrasonic energy heats things up anyway, so it got up to about 50 degrees Celsius. So that resulted in a rather nasty um, hardened brown oil left over some of the parts. So I've had to go through and manually clean all of them, which took ages. Um, but anyway, it's done now. So that means that we can begin with our reassembly of the movement and we begin firstly with the center wheel. All right, so I've done a little bit of research and I'm not sure whether this is the right method or not, but it's what I'm going to do anyway. And the suggestion that I found on the interweb is to basically oil this before putting the um, before putting the jewel on. So I've applied some uh, D5 to the arbor, and now we'll get this bridge on top.
there we are there's that little bridge on the center wheel is in and the jewel is oiled pretty happy about that okay next we'll drop the escape wheel in and you may have noticed that I'm not wearing finger cots that's okay as long as I don't touch anything now that it's been cleaned especially certainly do not want to touch it because it'll leave finger grease and finger marks on the movement but as long as I don't touch anything there's no need to wear finger cots so there's the escape wheel in place now we do the third wheel and it's got this really long extended pinion that sits through this hole but it has got its own bearing, its own jewel down the bottom. So now we put the fourth wheel in, which goes through the center wheel, like so. Oh, look at that. Okay, I made a video um, about how to install the train wheel bridge without screaming. So let's see now if I can manage to actually do that myself. That's two in, one to go. I think one's popped out. Come on. Yeah, the third wheel's popped out. There it is. 
space. Which of course means now the escape wheel's popped out. Come on. Okay, I think that's got them. I will kind of inspect under the microscope to be sure. But, yeah, I'm sure I can. So basically as I lift the, I'm looking for end shake. The pivots should be able to move up and down in the jewel holes. So I can actually grab hold of the wheel and move it up and I can see the pivot moving up and down in the jewel hole, which is what's supposed to happen. Uh, we just check the escape wheel. Yep. There we go. So our center wheel. Beautiful. A train wheel in motion is a beautiful thing to behold. So, I put those three, those four wheels in, well, three wheels really, because the center wheel's got its own jewel. So I put those three wheels in by physically manipulating them into the pivots rather than sort of like dropping the pivot, dropping the bridge onto the pivots. Um, it still only took me a few minutes, so I'm not stressed about this at all. I kind of stuffed it up at the beginning, you might have noticed, so I was trying to line it up on the wrong hole. Um, I was looking at, I think I was looking at this hole here and I started out trying to line up on that, which is not right, of course. Um, but yeah, it only took me a few minutes. So I'm pretty happy with that. So let's get some screws in this guy now. Right, so those are not nibbed down just yet because I just need to make sure the geometry, this is critical. So I need to make sure that everything is still free to turn and it is. Yeah, look at that. Look how long it keeps spinning just after I just put some energy into it. And remember, this hasn't got any oil on it yet. Apart from that one bearing. So that's pretty cool. So we'll just nib these up now. Awesome. One train wheel bridge installed.
Right, so now we need to reassemble the mainspring barrel. I decided on this occasion to buy a brand new mainspring rather than winding up the old one. Um, so this is when I got, I used the, the cross-reference table to select this mainspring. Now my understanding is, is that normally it goes in with the colour sided up. But I have checked my photographs as to how the old one was and it was around this way with the, yeah, the spring coming around like so. So this is definitely the way that the old one was in. So maybe it's, maybe I'm remembering incorrectly, but I was pretty sure it's the color sided up normally. And, um, but this spring is for a variety of movements. It's not specifically for this movement. So maybe it's just the right size, but it goes the other way in other movements, I don't know. So, and also this spring would also be pre-greased, so all that's got to happen is I've got to just pop it in. So let's see if we can do that without anything disastrous happening. Wow. Look at that. So now I need to get the arbor in. And if you remember the junk movement that I tore down, I had an absolute nightmare at this point. I just really, really struggled and I made a meal of it. And I think a lot of that was that I could not really see um, so now that I'm working under the microscope, hopefully um, it will be a whole lot better. Okay, I think we call that an absolute failure. So this has been an unmitigated disaster. What happened was that my fingers got in the way. I almost had it, which is why I was sort of like persisting in pushing. Um, I almost had it, but my fingers just got in the way so that I couldn't see anymore. And I was kind of trying to keep my fingers out of the way so that you guys could see. So then the whole thing just came springing out of the barrel, which is pretty disastrous. So everything went on the floor. So now I've got to try to find the arbor. Um, I don't know how I'll go. I have got a junk movement that I could pinch the arbor out of if I had to. Um, but yeah, that's a bit disappointing. A moment of grace, guys. I found the arbor. It took me about 10 seconds. It's actually stuck to the end of the tweezers. It was right on the end of the tweezers. So there's the arbor. So I've got all the bits, but now I'm gonna to have to pull out my main spring winder and wind this spring back up. Okay guys, as you can see, it is back in position. The way I got it back in there was to do what everybody says not to do. I wound it back in by hand, which was actually quite a lot easier than I thought that it would be. Um, but there's no other way I can get it in. The, the trick of trying to press it back into the washer that it came out of from the factory, that just wasn't gonna work because the, the end just kind of like springs out um, you'd need a tool or a jig to get it in there, which I haven't got. And I don't have a mainspring winder to wind this in the reverse direction that it needs to be. So, um, basically without buying some more tools, this was the only way that I was going to get it back in. So, um, it is back in. And yeah, the next step will be to try once again to get the upper in position. Hey, I think that might be it. Fingers crossed. So now we just need to fit the barrel lid. Got this tool, it should hopefully Just press it on like so. So now we just need to oil the bearings. 
for the barrel arbor. So now we can place the place the barrel back where it goes. So now we begin to assemble the barrel bridge. So firstly, this thing is easily forgotten. The setting lever screw needs to go in there because the barrel bridge goes over it. And once the barrel bridge is over, you cannot get the setting lever screw in. However, we also need to apply a little bit of oil to it as well. So some medium viscosity oil D5. So what I'm just going to do is we need to put that on some there and there, that should be fine. That was probably a little bit much, but um, that's what we've got the Rodigo for, is that we can just... Just soak up any excess oil with the Rodico. That looks better. And we'll just apply some oil also to the Top face. And now all we need to place the bridge. So you can probably see the screw holes either end that line up with there. And there, and there's our setting lever screw, so that goes through that hole there. So we'll just pop that there. There we go, look at that. So the actual only pivot that we needed to line up on that occasion was this one here, which is for the barrel. On some movements, the center pivot might be on the barrel bridge, but it's not on this one. So that's sitting nicely. We can see this is still free, turning easily. So now we just need to install the screws for this bridge.
That screwdriver was just a little bit small. It's important to try to use the right size screwdriver. Just before we nip this up, again, we just make sure that everything is free. Yep, that's free. Now we just nip these screws up. And that's the barrel bridge installed. Right, so I'm now going to lubricate the bearings. There's a couple of different ways you can go about doing this. So I noticed that some people, they will do this um, towards the end of the assembly. So they'll basically assemble everything and then they will uh, put things together. Uh, they'll, they'll do the lubrication. Um, I'm sort of following the order in um, Mark Lovick's watch repair lessons, which I found pretty useful actually. They don't really tell you anything new per se, but I just found it really helpful to have everything together all in the one place and it's easy to go back and reference it. So um, that's why I'm lubricating these now. And there's also like a couple of... Um, rules of thumb I suppose as to what lubricants you should use where so this is D5 well it's actually the synthetic version of D5 um, I think synthetics are, are better than the natural greases because they just tend to be more stable so um, that's what I'm using here and the general rule of thumb is that things that rotate have oil, things that slide have grease. So this rotates, obviously. And then there's two kinds of oil that we generally speaking use. So the D5 is the medium viscosity oil. And we use that for things that rotate uh, at a slower sort of a speed. And then we use the highest viscosity oil, uh, the runniest one, or the lightest oil. I can never remember which way around viscosity works, so it's the lightest oil. And we use that on things that move the fastest. So that generally would be the, the fourth wheel because you remember how movement works, the fourth wheel moves the fastest, and the escape wheel. So I'm applying some D5 to the third wheel. Yeah, gosh, it's... You certainly do not want a lot of oil, so when I brought this over, see the amount of oil that's on that? I know it's out of focus, but that would be way too much oil. Look, that oil would completely fill the cup, which is not what you want at all. So you've got to kind of, and this is the smallest oil that I have, so you've got basically got to learn how to control the amount of oil that you get onto the oiler. So anyway, that's the um, third wheel. Now, if you remember when we assembled the train wheel, that this one here is actually the fourth wheel. So you remember that I just said the fourth wheel we're going to want to use some of this lightest viscosity oil. So let's see how we go here. Yeah, I like the look of that. That was good. So you remember that we lubricated the center wheel bearing because it's nested. So that bearing was underneath. It had its own little bridge. And then this is the escape wheel here. Yeah, that's nice. I like the look of that. So we get this nice little ring sort of like just forms around 
the pivot and that's all we need uh, even that was probably a little bit too much but it's not swimming in it is the point so this is d5 and this is the bottom of the mainspring so in that goes this one here is the third wheel So we want D5 on that one as well. Just the tiniest little bit of oil. Wow. The escape wheel has got a capsule, so that's going to have to come out to be able to oil that. And then we've also got... This arrangement here. We need D5 here. There we go. This screw is so small. Itty bitty. There we go, we got it. One cap jewel out. Right, so I am not quite sure what is the correct way to apply the oil to this. I've given it a good clean. It was actually pretty scungy because I had not disassembled this jewel when I cleaned the movement. So it's sort of still had all oil and horrible stuff under there. So I cleaned all that out and that's looking pretty good now. Um, but in terms of applying the oil to this, this cap looks pretty flat to me. Um, and I was thinking about applying the oil to the cap as a pool and then flipping it over and sitting it down but I honestly can't see why I wouldn't just do the normal thing um, in terms of applying the oil to here I don't know why it has this cap to be honest so why don't I give that a go uh, not that much though Yeah, I think that looks okay to me. So if any of you know why there is this cap jewel, you might like to leave a comment down below. So that goes on there. Now we just need to try to find our itty bitty screw and not lose it. I guess you really wouldn't want to be prone to fits of sneezing doing this, would you? Probably not. Come on. So tiny, this thing.
Right, so now we can just continue with rebuilding the um, barrel bridge. So I don't know that this is actually necessary, but I'm just going to put a little bit of oil just here. And then the crown will ring. This does have an up and a down. You can tell which is up. The upside tends to be more machined than the downside, if that makes any sense at all. So I'll just put that one in there. And we'll just put some oil on the outside of that, like so. And then the crown wheel just pops on like that. Right, so just before we install the screw for the crown wheel, I'm just going to apply a little bit of D5 just in here. Actually, might put a little bit more than that in. That should be all right. So now we need to install the screw for the crown wheel. And there are two screws that look very, very similar. However, this one will have a slightly shorter thread because otherwise it will fail with the crown works. And also this screw is reverse threaded, as you can see. Okay, guys, so you might have picked up that I have made an error, believe it or not, but also I've had a bit of a disaster. So, the error that I made is if you remember back to the disassembly, the click spring actually goes underneath the ratchet wheel. So I'm just going to need to take the ratchet wheel out again. That's not a problem, that won't take very long. One screw and one ratchet wheel, out you come. Because the spring for the click sits in here. It kind of looks almost like a paper clip. Now, the disaster that I had is somehow or other, I managed to lose the spring. Um, because as you can see, it's not actually all that small. Um, quite a lot of click screws, uh, click springs are much smaller than that. So, um, I've lost it in the process of cleaning, I believe. Um, so, I had to pinch one out of the junk movement that I have. <sighs> See how easily they fly away. So the other junk movement that I have came from the same seller on eBay and it is utterly disgusting. 
in terms of the oil that is inside of it. It's, it is again full of oil, but the oil, it looks more like motor oil. Whereas the oil, this one was drenched in oil, but at least it looks like machine oil. But the other one, it's this thick uh, orange brown motor oil. And yeah, it's just, just horrid. So obviously someone who had no idea what they were doing had got their hands on these movements and was having a go at them and just completely made a mess of it. So hopefully we can do a little bit better than that. Okay, so I'm guessing um, I could go and check my video, but I think that this is on the correct side of correct side of the spring. The spring is underneath there. Just before I screw this up, figuratively, not literally, I'm just going to put a little bit of uh, D5 just on here. Oops. That's not meant to go down there. Right, so now I need to get the setting lever installed. Uh, I had to review my video just to work out which way around it goes. This, there's like a long arm and a short arm. This is a short arm, this is a long arm. So this, this peg here engages with the setting lever spring. So this is the way around that it goes. So, you guys might not be able to see very much, but what I need to do, goodness me, my finger's enormous, is um, I need to hold this on while I flip the movement sideways and screw it from the other side. So I've got to basically screw this on now. So we'll see how we go with this method first. And if this doesn't work, I have got a plan B. I know you couldn't see anything then, but guess what? That makes two of us. We'll see how that goes. If it doesn't feel right as I assemble the rest of it, I might have to have another go at that, but yeah, there we go. Right, so here we have the winding pinion, is this one here, and the sliding clutch. So I'm just going to lubricate these with just some, this is grease. Some people use D5 here, um, others use grease. As you can see, it's a very runny grease. But, you know, I generally go by the rule of thumb that if it's a sliding part, use grease. And technically, these parts slide against one another. So I think that should be sufficient of that. And so now we need to obviously install it into the movement. And it goes there. And now this one goes in this way, like that. 
that. Right, so I now need to just um, lubricate the winding stem. And again, I'm using grease to do this. And basically it's every face, but we just sort of like do both sides. We don't, don't try to coat the whole thing. Should be perfect. So now we need to just install the stem. Jiggle, jiggle. There we go. I think that's in. See how this little pivot here has engaged with that recess. And as I pull it in and out, it moves the setting lever back and forth. That's what's meant to happen. Okay, so that's in place. So I might just just slightly tighten up the setting lever screw just so that this stuff doesn't sort of fall out. Right, so now we're going to install the cannon pinions. So we just need to apply some grease to this surface of the center wheel. And that's going to be heaps, if not a little bit too much. Okay. So I slide this down. Okay, so I need to make sure this is all the way down. So it is all the way down. But sometimes what happens is it pushes the pushes the wheel back through. but that all looks like it's in order. Right, so we just need to apply a little bit of D5 to the post for the yoke spring. And I'm gonna apply some grease to this little divot here. Oops. This little divot here. which is where the um, end of the yoke will rest. So we want this to be nicely lubricated like that. That looks pretty good. So now we're just going to place the yoke in its position, hopefully. Now 
this end needs to just sit in. There we are there. So this end sits in there. That sits there. And now we need to get the yoke spring in place. So I had to go and look at my photographs just to see how this uh, sits. Oops, that was bad. Spring just flew away. Oh no. Alright, well, disaster averted on this occasion because I pinched the yoke spring out of the junk movement. So if I lose this one, I'm in big trouble. But yeah, the, the problem that I've got. is I've got a construction site outside and it's just trucks and stuff going and coming all the time and it's just a nightmare so I'm trying to film in between trucks and so on and so rushing things a little bit which is not really too good so I was kind of um, yeah sliding things back and forth without the um, without the setting lever spring in place which is what holds this in and stops things from flying everywhere so what I should do is put the setting lever spring in place now and that will yeah hopefully stop things flying away okay so yeah, that's it's about there. That looks better. Okay. Here comes another truck. Bit of grease in there. Okay, so that's working nicely the way that it should be now. So I'm just going to apply some D5 to this post here, which will have an intermediate wheel going on it, and also to this post here, which will have the um, minute wheel go on it. It's just a little bit too much oil on there. We'll just try that one again. That 
that's better. So we just pop this intermediate wheel goes on here. And the minute wheel goes on there without the bit of fluff that it picked up. There we are. We can see there's a little recessed hole for the screw there, and then there's this locating pin here. So this is around the right way. So, yeah, on this side be a bit easier to see. That's winding. And then here is to adjust the motion work. So that's working and that's working. Beautiful. So there's actually a missing screw here for the barrel bridge. Um, it has three screws, one, two, three, and I'd only fitted two. So I think that larger different screw is probably for the balance would be my guess. Uh, so yeah, I now have the right number of screws. It's just will be a case of working out which one goes where, and that's just a little bit small, that screwdriver. So, yeah, that's good. We've now got the right number of screws. Right, so now we need to fit the pallet fork. We're really starting to get to the, the business end now of this movement. So now we need to put this little bridge on, so that sits there, and now what we're going to need to do I need to get the pivot of the pallet fork through the jewel. There it is. Okay. So now obviously we want just make sure that nothing's fouling in terms of the stones. The stones are not fouling anything. So now we just need to fit this screw so that it stays in place. That's better. Screws a little bit too small that screwdriver so 
What should happen now is if I put some wind into the watch, Okay, you've got some wine into it now. We should be able to see as I manipulate the pallet fork. Yeah, beautiful. See it snapping back and forth under power. Which is exactly what it's meant to do. So the question is, am I feeling brave enough now to try to put in the balance. Let's put some more wine into this. Let's be brave and give it a go. So this is actually a lot harder than it looks, I think. Um, I don't think I have it aligned with the actual engaged. I don't have the jewel engaged is the thing. It's in the pivot, but it's not engaged. So how do we do that? Could try a slightly different technique. Now I did read somewhere, actually, I think I might need to have this sort of, oh, there we are there. I need to have that there. I did read somewhere to sort of like come in like this and then rotate. So I have to pick up the location. Look at that. It's running. Goodness gracious me, it is actually running. Because you remember we put power in it. And so yeah, I think that was the technique was to kind of put it in at that angle and then rotate it so that the, the jewel and the balance engaged 
with the puppet fork and now it is actually running well isn't that wonderful so i'll just pop the um, screw in the balance just so it doesn't fall out or anything and we will go from there Come on, get in there. Well guys, I've got to say I'm really excited. Um, we're not finished yet, there's a few more things that we've got to do yet. Obviously we've got to regulate the movement, there's a little bit more um, oiling to do. We've got to do these uh, end stones in the balance have got to be done yet. Uh, we do not do the end stones for the pivot fork, it's generally accepted that it's bad practice to lubricate those. We've also got to lubricate the, um, the actual jewels on the pallet fork that engage with the that make with the escape wheel because you've got those mating surfaces but I'm really excited because this is my first ever strip down and rebuild of a watch that has actually worked the last one I did was a junk movement um, it wasn't expected to work when it came together and I made a few catastrophic blunders but this one okay I lost a couple of parts but I didn't actually break anything so that's something and it is actually running, so that's really, really wonderful. And yeah, let's um, move on to the next steps. Right, so what we need to do now is to oil the pallet fork jewels, which is going to be extremely fiddly. And I just need to get like the tiniest little dab of oil onto the end stone like so. So we just sort of spread it out like this. Anyway, I don't need to do all of this on camera. I'll keep persisting until I'm happy with this and I'll come back. Okay folks, I guess it was kind of too much to hope for that we would kind of get this thing back together without another catastrophe. Uh, it's kind of frustrating because we almost had this thing done and dusted. I only had to do the uh, end stone jewels and the balance and that was it. So I was just refitting the balance um, so I was to be able to do that. I was really happy with how the oiling of the pallet fork end stones went. Um, as you can see, the impulse jewel has come off the balance. Um, I don't think it was anything that I did because... You know, um, there's no way I exerted enough force um, to tear it off. It, it just seems to have like fallen off. Um, and it looks like it was actually engaged correctly in the, um, in the pallet fork. It looked to me like it actually kicked up and then it stopped. Um, so for some reason it has kind of come off or I don't know what has happened. And anyway, it's something fairly catastrophic so I don't think this will be something I'll be able to fix myself so it's probably going to have to go back to my watchmaker for him to rebuild the balance again um, anyway I'll have a look and see if there's anything that I can do um, and we'll go from there I'm aware this video is ending up quite a bit longer than I'd want it to, it to be and uh, a lot of that is for, th this has had a really, really steep learning curve for a number of reasons. I'm trying to learn sort of all sorts of things. So there's the cameras, learning how to do the cameras, learning how to do the watch stuff, obviously, as well. And then also um, sort of the video editing. The whole point of this, I suppose, was that I wanted to document my journey from start to finish but I want to make it you know watchable for you guys as well uh, which means I need to you know capture good quality footage and so on 
So that means there's a tremendous learning curve for me. I've been doing most of my filming to date on iMovie, but where I want to go, it's pretty clear that iMovie just isn't going to cut it anymore. So um, I've got DaVinci Resolve, but once I got DaVinci Resolve installed, it became pretty clear that it was not going to... Um, my MacBook Pro was not going to be able to cut it on DaVinci Resolve. So um, I bought the cheapest Mac Mini that I could get, which is like the, um, the, the new M2 models. And it's basically twice as fast as my MacBook Pro and it's got a media encoding engine in it. So um, that's a big help for the video editing. But I'm having to learn how to do um, DaVinci Resolve. So I've got a huge learning curve on DaVinci Resolve. And um, as I mentioned, also the cameras as well, also the microscope. Um, I started doing the edit while I had my watch with the watchmaker. And um, I realized that I didn't actually get some of the footage that I wanted or I thought that I had. I thought I had a heap of footage which, with the microscope and it turns out that I don't have that footage at all um, for reasons I won't bore you with. So anyway, um, I'm actually now using my, um, my Camlink 4K to capture the video out of the camera. So hopefully I've got a bit more um, footage in this last part, but um, yeah, as you know, I'm sort of towards the end of this rebuild, hopefully. So yeah, so that's where we're at. So that brings me back to the story as to where I'm at with the rebuild. So, um, you'll recall that I had a disaster. I seem to have a few of those, don't I? Yeah, just as I'm talking, obviously I'm cleaning the end stones in the balance. So where we got to last time was that the, um, the jewel on the roller table of the balance fell out. I'm just looking to see whether there's a, um, an up and a down to this it's just a bit hard to tell I mean I can tell which way it was in like this side was down in the jewel but when I clean it will it be obvious I think so because yeah this side's rounded see this side is domed so what I need to do now is to clean this jewel and the way that I'll do that is just by dipping it dropping it in some one dip just letting it sit in there for a little bit and um, out it will come. Yeah, so what happened is the, the impulse jewel came out of the roller table and I took it to my watchmaker because I don't have the ability to be able to do that myself. So I wanted him to reset the jewel. So we've had Easter since between then, so there's been a heap of time. It's about two weeks since I've done anything on this watch, and it's taken me months now to get through this movement. So long story short is that um, I went to see him today, and he hasn't actually been able to fix the roller um, just because of the small size of it. Um, so I've got the other junk movement, and what he wants me to do is to take the junk movement to him and he will rebuild the balance because that junk movement has got a, um, a roller table in it with the impulse jeweler still set. So that's what he'll do. All right, so we now need to oil this jewel. which will probably be much easier said than done. But, um, what 
what we're aiming to do is to get about a 30% circle. So a circle covering 30%. So I know if I put that much oil on, it's going to be more than 30%. Let's try this. Okay, so that's obviously not correct at all. So that's more like 70% um, of the jewel. So that's just way too much oil. So that's my first ever attempt. So what we need to do now is clean that oil off. Okay, I'm happy with that. On here like this. There we are. So now I just have to do the same to the other side. Right, so now we need to get this bottom tool out as well. So we just need to give that a bit of a dunk in the one dip again. There we go. Such the smallest little bit of oil could hardly see any oil on the oiler itself but that's basically what we want i believe come on that should be it All right, we're just about in a position to um, put this watch back together, I hope. So just going to give the dial a bit of a clean up. And we can actually see that a lot of this gunk is coming off really quite nicely. Well, unfortunately, I think I've made this dial worse. There was a heap of gunk on it. And normally... And I knew this, and I shouldn't have done it. You don't use any sort of a solvent on the dial. And it's because there was so much gunk on the dial, I did use some solvent to try to get it off because I could see it coming off. But unfortunately, it's taken off more than it should have. But hopefully, 
I mean, it looks pretty horrendous under the microscope. But um, hopefully once it's in the watch with the glass over the top of it, it should look okay. It's still a quite nice um, dial. So yeah, you know, the whole point of this, the only way you learn these things is from your mistakes, even though you intellectually know things until you've actually done it. A lot of the time until you actually make the mistake, it really kind of reinforces um, that, yeah, you don't do that. So yeah, we knew that was going to be the way it would be from day one. So there we go. So anyway, let's continue on with getting this thing back together. I've not actually sort of like, I don't recall seeing people put um, oil on here when they put this wheel on, but I kind of like feel like I should, because again, it's you know, a rotating sort of surface following my own rules. So I just feel like I should put some D5 on here, because now we're going to put the hour wheel on, which goes there. There we are. Finally, the second hand. There we go. Okay, so I've done a pretty rough and ready um, adjustment on this, but I'm pretty happy with this actually, given this is a f my first attempt ever to regulate a watch. I haven't bothered about with different you know, angles and so on, which you're supposed to do. Um, this is all a bit rough and ready, I acknowledge, but um, I'm pretty happy with that. Minus three seconds a day. Um, it's sort of hovering around, you know, plus two to minus three. So on average, that's about zero. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So yeah, let's get this thing back together. Right, we just need to put it back into the case just give it a bit of a blow make sure it's clean right that ring is in it Seems to be very difficult to get in, not sure why, but it's in now. So I just need to replace the O-ring that goes on this case back. I replaced the O-ring on the um, stem as well, but very fiddly, so I did that off camera. So I just got this little box um, of grease that you just put the o-ring into and then basically do this and that will 
oil the ring. It winds and the hands turn. Unfortunately, you can see though the damage that I've done to the dial, so that's kind of really, a, I guess, a learning experience for me because that was the favourite part of this watch for me was the dial. And I have, yeah, I'm afraid to say I have made a meal of the dial. Oh, and it's still quite nice, you know, my dad will like it, um, but. Yeah, I'm a bit annoyed with myself for having done that. But as I said before, you don't make mistakes, you don't learn. So there we are. All right, so I've just got one more thing to do now, and that's to put the strap on this. Aha, gotcha. That's that end in. Okay, so there we are, it's all back together and it's even running. Let's hopefully it will stay running and stay running well. Um, yeah, look, I, th I think overall for my first watch repair, I'm reasonably happy. I mean, this was not running and uh, it is now running. It has been completely stripped down, rebuilt and regulated. Um, really the only bad thing is, is I've kind of ruined the dial, as I mentioned, um, but you know, you've got to learn from these things to be able to do nicer watches and better watches. So I do hope that you've uh, enjoyed this video. Thanks for staying with me to the end. Please subscribe, like and share. And I really look forward to seeing you on the next video and watch out.